Greetings. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Do Business Better podcast. It's me, your host, Damian Mason. Got a great show for you today because I have a great guest for you. We talk about a person that's been there and done that. Her name is Shannon Hayes. She's the author of Redefining Rich. She is an entrepreneur. She owns rental properties, a farm, fourth generation farmer, no less, doing direct to consumer grass fed protein products up in northern New York. She's going to tell you all about that. She has a restaurant. She also writes books. She's got a lot going on. She's the CEO. Uh, her and her husband are entrepreneurs together, raising their family, and she's not against making her kids do some work also. So you should appreciate that. Shannon Hayes, welcome to the Do Business Better podcast. Hey, Damien. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Okay, so you and I have written books. You and I are farm kids. You and I both went to agricultural schools, and you and I believe ourselves to be entrepreneurial. So when I, your stuff came across my desk, I'm like, you know what? I need to have this person on here to talk to other people about what we do. So um, give us the background. There you are. You're going to Cornell University. This is not, you know, this, this ain't some Ivy Tech. You're going to Cornell University, and you're pursuing a PhD. Uh, take me from there. Yeah, so um, I, interestingly enough, I should tell you, I was rejected from Cornell three times. And on, on the final try, I actually called them up and told them that they made a mistake and they needed to let me in, that they did owe me an education. Yeah. And that as a, as a child of a New York State farm, I deserved a chance to go. And it worked, I got in. And um, while I was there though, I was a diligent student and I had grown up on a farm, as you said, on, in the northern Catskills. And I grew up in the farm crisis. And from the background that you and I talked about, we both know what that farm crisis was like. We were both very alive and there was a lot of tragedy to be experienced to go around for all of us at that time. So I grew up with this understanding that life in agriculture is doomed to fail. But I also grew up with a passion for the rocks, the fields, the fencing, the livestock, and the people. I really, really loved this lifestyle. So I went to sustainable agri, I went to Cornell rather, to study this field of sustainable agriculture to see if I could figure out how to fix it. And my plan, knowing that farming was a failing enterprise, was that I would figure out how to fix it. I'd become an academic of all things. And because then I'd have a steady paycheck while I told everybody else how to fix it. Yeah, you're going to be you're going to be the professor, the old thing of those who can do, those who can't teach. Um, and to, put, <laughs> and to put things in perspective here, you know, our listeners are entrepreneurs, want to be entrepreneurs, aspiring small business people, gig economy people, sole proprietors, self-employed types. And this is not a podcast about agriculture. It's a podcast about achieving the life on your terms, which is right. something I talk about in my own book, Do Business Better, Life and Business on your terms. And it's never always that way. Come on, man. Like people say, <laughs> if you like what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. It's like bullshit. You know, there's still days that are a lot of work. I like what I do, but sometimes I'm hopping on planes. I've been up since five. I'm still running at 10 o'clock at night. Pretty or you're on your knees cleaning the toilet in your rest ca in your cafe. <laughs> you're in a restaurant. There's times when you're in there, uh, you know, cleaning out the refrigerator. Do you love what you do? Okay. It's still work. But the point is, you had that farm kid work ethic. You also had seen failure. Um, you know, I'm in ag a lot now. And farming, you said a failing endeavor. It's not really, but coming out of the 80s, that's what we thought. Um, right. And I'll tell you what happened there um, was I was studying to be a professor because I thought it was my ba it, it was my lead plan with farming as my backup. And um, no secret, I'm a female here. And um, I started noticing uh, how women in academia were treated. And I started making, I made a list one day of every female professor I'd had in 10 years of higher education. And I wanted to know, I was um, engaged to get married. I wanted to have kids. Um, I wanted to stay married and I wanted to hold on to my job. These were like my four big goals at that time in my life. Sure. And I made a list of every female professor and who had I had in my academic career and realized that none of them had achieved this. And that's when I said, well, if I thought ag was bad, I think academia is worse. And so uh, I was passionate about the research, passionate about living, living my learning. And I decided that the best future for me to have a life where I could have a happy marriage and be with my family 
and continue to have a livelihood was to go figure out a way to make that farm work. And, um, and then learned that to really make that farm work, I got to be an entrepreneur in ways that I never imagined. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, there's, and we're, and we're going to get to the dirt of this because, um, you know, the person that's like, oh gosh, that sounds like a dream. I want to be her. I'm sure that Shannon will tell you there were days and nights that were far from a dream because of the work that it had to happen, or there's probably times you took a risk or whatever. So let's talk about that. So when did you, when did you start on your own? I mean, you really, were you employed by the university and then quit or you never even became a university employee? No, I never became a university employee. I uh, defended my dissertation and my dissertation was on, on the future <laughs> of, of agriculture in, in my region. And then I just, I stood up, I cleaned out my desk and I went home to make it happen. And, you know, September rolled around and uh, my peers were starting their lives in their academic cubicles. And um, my husband and I were patching life together to make ends meet. I remember it was a beautiful September morning, clear blue sky. And I was painting some guy's deck. I was up on, climbed up on top of his roof, painting the roof of his deck. And sometimes I was weeding. Sometimes I was doing pickup work. I was doing anything, anything to be free. And then we eventually built our businesses. Yeah. So remember, I, I always tell folks 27 years I've been at this and you'd say 27 years self-employed. And I always point out then to folks, Mike, there's really no such thing as self-employed. You can't just keep paying yourself. You work for other people. You were doing that and doing whatever you could to pay the bills. Tell me about starting the business, which came, okay, there's the farm, the restaurant, rental properties, uh, now writing books, giving some speeches. You do a lot of different stuff. You wear a few hats. Tell me, um, take me back and, and take our listeners back. When when did it start to gel? Oh, probably the day I scared the crap out of my parents. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was getting ready to defend my, my dissertation and I was starting the, the job search process. And what happened was um, I got a couple interviews and realized when I had my, my phone interviews that I wasn't really impressing people very well. <laughs> and I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder. And something was just sticking in my craw. And um, I'm, if you're an entrepreneur, I didn't know this defined an entrepreneur, but you have these little lists with like, no, you can't even say like numbers. You're always scratching numbers, habitually scratching numbers all over everything. And um, I hung up the phone and I started doing some tallying and I was figuring out my husband and I had a job prospect where uh, he and I could um, both have professional jobs. There you go, you got your numbers too. <laughs> I want to just actually, you know, a lot of people listen to this, but dear listener, if you listen to this, wherever you, you're, you know, iPad, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, but you also can view this, go to the Damien Mason channel on YouTube, because it's a lot of fun to watch. You'd be able to see Shannon sitting there in her awesome uh, mountain retreat with a wood stove in the background and a couple of Adirondack chairs. But she talked about numbers. <laughs> uh, mapping out some expenses, mapping out, mapping out some revenue and balance sheet issues. And this was just, this, like you said, it was just yesterday when I said, hey, Lori, let me run some stuff on that real quick. And I ran out some numbers, revenue, balance sheet, uh, you know, accounts receivable, monthly projections, and then um, the hardcore expenses I've got to come up with. And then another thing of expenses that we might take on if a new investment. So yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Now, see, my husband will stay up late at night, like binge watching Netflix. And my thing that keeps me up late at night and with not a little bit of stress at all, because it's so exciting to me is number crunching. I really do like number crunching. So anyhow, I started crunching numbers with these prospective jobs, him and me both having full time professional jobs. And I was calculating the cost of relocation, the cost of wardrobes. I was backing out taxes. I was backing out having to buy rather than grow our own food. And when I backed out all these expenses, what I realized was that with two professional full-time jobs and both of us working 40 to 50 hours a week, we were only going to come out $10,000 ahead of where we would be if we just stayed home join the family farm. They didn't have any salary lines for us. We would just be subsistence living pretty much at that point. And, and we didn't even have kids yet. So there was no daycare in the cost. So I called my father up and you know, my father was a PhD, is a PhD. He was a college professor. Um, and uh, I called him up and I said, dad, I can't afford to get a job. 
And he was just like, you, you could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> and I said, I'm, I'm running the numbers here. I, I, think, I think the game is rigged. And I think that if I go forward and try to chase this career, um, I'm going to be, I'm going to be chasing my tail here. And, um, he was very quiet and he said, fine, but you can't take a dime out of the farm. And so I said, sounds like a deal. <laughs> so we started with nothing and I started doing, in, in the book, I talk about, um, two different kinds of, of business startups. There's the start rights and the start nows. And at that point I started with the start nows. You know, I did pick up work like I was telling you, you know, Bob and I would fix things for people and, you know, weed people's gardens, mow people's lawns, whatever, just to, to pay the expenses. And then I started doing little mini start now entrepreneurship ventures, making my own chopstick, making my own jelly. Basically I figured out if I was wasting money on it, I could probably make it and pump it through the farm sales channels because the farm was already direct marketing meets. And so I started this is 20, this is 20 some years ago, Shannon. Yeah. Yep. So you were a little ahead of the curve on that. So you did have some customer base. You had some customer base coming to the parents farm. Uh, yep. And so you said, I'm going to do this. And by the way, I'm more about the start now because what I have discovered is the start rights they've decided that there's never a time that's right. The time's not right. The economy, right. They're advice junkies, advice junkies. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> well, I, I, you know, right now with things being the way they are, I'm like, you told me that eight months ago and three years ago with things as they are, things are, I said, you realize that things are always going to be something, yeah. you know, it's everything is always going to conspire against you. I will say though, Damien. So I started a lot of start now ventures and I got pretty good at just those types of figures, these back of the napkin, scratching things out, figuring out things and how to turn it around quick. And my rule as a start now was, uh, you don't do a start now unless you've got the money in your back pocket. And so I would recover the expenses on one venture, start the next one, and then start the next one. And so what happened is like, it started with chapstick, the chapstick turned into soap, the soap turned into jam, the jam turned into a, a chocolate truffle business, and then the chocolate truffle business uh, eventually turned into meat cookbooks, meat cookbooks turned into another meat cookbook, turned into another book, and then turned into a building that we were able to buy, and that building then turned into a cafe, and that was time to start right. When we were about to invest a quarter million dollars into getting ourselves going, then I started right. And that's when, you know, we flew to Seattle, we trained, we did professional uh, barista training with, we, we went into different coffee shops, we looked at different cafe setups. We did that, we wrote business plans and crunched the numbers for, you know, five year, 10 year projections. But until that time, we did a lot of start now. And so by the time we got to the start right venture, we were really, really uh, strong. And once we got that one big start right venture, then the other enterprises would just, you know, it was really easy to grab the next enterprise and grab the next enterprise because I could do a business plan within 60 minutes on new ventures. And so then we went back to starting now is on a lot of bigger ventures. <laughs> yeah, I like it. So um, when you talked about chapstick became generic pretend self homemade chapstick became soap became jam, you kept those things going. Right now, is there still a soap? Is there still a jam? Do you have a, and that's all your your brand on that? Is that the um, uh, sap, sap bush hollow? Uh, yeah. Product? Yes. I don't do the jam anymore because eventually I decided that the labor involved was was not worth it when there's a lot of people around here who absolutely love to make and sell their homemade jam. So I don't bother with that. But the soaps and the salves, chapsticks, I stuck with all that because it's all based on uh, rendering pork fat from the farm. So it's helping us use a byproduct and the, the return on investment for that is very, very good. It doesn't take a lot to turn around. All right, so um, tell us about your business now and then we'll go back and maybe ask a few starting questions. So uh, the person that's listening to the Do Business Better podcast is saying, hey man, I, I've got a business. I've got an idea for a business or I wanna be like her, whatever. Yeah. Um, wh what, what's it look like today? Okay. Well, uh, in the book, I talk about four primary forms of income and I say every, every entrepreneur needs three of the four. Um, the first one is 
meaningful, <laughs> meaningful work, meaningful employment. I don't have that. But if you have a job that you really like, you need that if as part, one of one of three in out of your the four options. The second one is business income. All right, so I got a lot of that. Business income, um, Sapwish Hollow Farm, LLC. We now own a couple rental properties. We have vacation rentals as well. We have, I don't know if you have that in, option in Indiana, but we have one of those tenter vacation sites on the property. Tenter? Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. We can talk okay. about that if you want. Um, uh, yeah, we'll get back to that. I'm writing down some notes. And then we have the cafe. And then the different enterprises within the farm. So, you know, we have the meats and we have the, the value added skin products and we got a line of, uh, you know, all natural groceries, all those things within that business. So that's business income. And then the next form of income that I talk about is non-monetary income. And there was another book I wrote about this called Radical Homemakers, but I delve into it in Redefining Rich. Non-monetary income in my life is humongous because um, uh, non-monetary income is anything you can do for yourself where you don't have to pay somebody. And um, in my case, that's a lot of things. For, I'm a great cook. We don't go out to eat at all. That's a classic example. But I actually negotiate lots of things like the fact that I'm sitting with you um, talking over high speed internet. I've got Fios installed in my house for free by my local internet company by striking some exchanges. I invested a little bit in the company, helped with their PR. I don't pay for any internet. Um, so that's part of our non-monetary income. More non-monetary income in my case um, is I homeschool my kids and uh, one of my kids has a cerebral visual impairment, which meant she was gonna have to, if, if I was gonna hire the expert, she'd have to go to a $40,000 a year school. Um, so I took on her developmental work and worked outside uh, and worked independently with a therapist, did it at home. And so that's part of my non-monetary income because I don't pay that out. So that lowers our cost of living. A lot of things that what you would call a homemaker does is non-monetary income. And that's very important in our, our income portfolio. And you the, just said, okay, we got four things, meaningful mm -hmm. income. And you're saying that that, you said you uh, didn't have that. Meaningful meaning? Meaningful employment. Meaningful employment. What's business that? income. Meaningful employment is a job that's worth going to. Oh. A job that you don't hate. A okay. job that actually makes your heart sing. Okay. And, is, and does it have to have a certain amount of revenue? Does it have to be a certain income level? Yeah, you know, people have to decide what works for them. I'm in, I'm in the Northern Catskills. The income does not have to be very high to have a really great quality of life out here. Okay, so meaningful, so meaningful, meaningful employment, business mm -hmm. income, non-monetary income, and then the final one is passive income. And passive income, now <clears throat> I call it passive income from a farmer's perspective because um, as you've just described, when you work as a farmer, <laughs> there are a lot of things that seem passive compared to the work of agriculture. And so the IRS has a very specific definition of passive income. I consider anything where I'm not working from dawn till dusk on it and I'm not physically on my feet all day as passive. So for example, um, long-term rentals for me are passive income. Um, writing books and then getting royalties that's passive income. It's the kind of income when you're in a business like mine that's very physically active. I need that passive income because that's my insurance. That's, you know, if I break my leg and I'm going to be laid up for a couple months, I need that passive income to make sure things are going to still be rolling for me. That could be portfolio income for somebody, socially responsible investments. It could be, you know, if you're an app developer and you get royalties from that. There are a lot of different options. We also do business to business uh, loaning, loans for passive income. So if we have other businesses that in the community that we're trying to get started, that's another form of that too. So you, you, yeah. you yourself, you and your husband will write a check to somebody that says, I'm gonna start a, uh, a pastry shop down the road here. And you we're a partnership, oh. we're a partnership. My husband and I are at the younger stage of that. So um, it's a four way partnership with two elders. And so, the check comes from the elders and then my husband and I, yes, we have written some checks too, to like a local food co-op that was getting started. Uh, we invested in them. It was, it was one of the best investments we ever made. Okay. So you got, uh, and, and I agree with you as a 27 years now going on 20, starting 28 of, uh, self unemployment. I, um, 
I don't have a job that I uh, want to go to and um, in, in, the, in the traditional sense. I haven't had for a long time. Uh, business income I've had since 1994. Non-monetary income, I, I agree with you that there are these things that it's almost bartering, but then there's also, um, like you said, ways to save. My wife always says, Damien, you know what? We never go on vacation. I said, I booked a speaking engagement in Hawaii and we grabbed three extra days from the client to go there and hang out. Uh, she says, well, yeah, but you were working. I said, well, for part of the time, so we have a house in Arizona with a swimming pool and a 2,000 acre mountain preserve behind our house that we go and ride mountain bikes in. Is that not almost vacation? <laughs> I, I look at these things as non-monetary income also, like ways that we save and uh, like you said, things that we do and, and produce on our own. So I agree with you. And then, of course, the passive income. I, I just posted something on social media yesterday, Shan, about the need to have some multiple revenue sources. You want to be independent and not like stressed out to where you develop some sort of stomach problems during times like pandemic and the government shuts down the you can't work um having revenue coming in from other sources really um it, it not only keeps you whole but it also makes you can sleep at night so that's yeah. very important so i love your four things continue <laughs> You, you, here you well, are. Well, yeah. So, so I would say. In the late to, 40s, you've got these different things going on, and you've been at this a while now. I mean, what, 22 years, probably? Something like that. That's about right. Yeah. 20 years. 20 years. Mm hmm. Um, I would say what's important to remember about those things is keeping the soul whole and the marriage alive and the family well. And so you don't just choose three out of the four and say, well, that opportunity is available or that opportunity is available. It comes down to quality of life and the quality of life that you vision. And so my life, you know, it looks like I got a lot going on, but before I talked to you today, I spent a couple hours in the woods hanging out with my husband. Um, I hung out with my daughter in the kitchen while she showed me this new dress she's designing and sewing herself. And um, I'm going to hang out with my kids tonight. There'll be a nice cocktail hour. I uh, took a nap before we talked, made sure I was well rested. Um, these are quality of life things. Yep. I am not on my feet all the time. And I don't take pride in bragging at how hard I work. Um, because if I did, I'd be broken. Mm -hmm. And I'm in this for the long game. And where that comes from is a quality of life statement that came up um, that my husband and I, we drafted it. We don't even have it on the wall anymore, but we drafted a long time ago about the things that we knew that were important to us. We needed to remain in touch with nature. I needed to be writing because it keeps me happy. We wanted our home to be the center of our lives. We did not want to be going anywhere, which is another one of those reasons uh, we were talking before why I don't do farmer's markets anymore. We are, my whole life is in this teeny tiny little community unless we're going to make a big trip out. Um, so that's all coming from the quality of life. I don't drive anywhere. Uh, I keep my stress low. I keep my quality of life high. And that comes from articulating very clearly a statement that my husband and I drafted together, that my kids were very much a part of about how we want to live. And then when you go for your three out of those four kinds of income, you hold them up against that statement. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't hold water with the quality of life that you're after, it ain't the right venture to be in. So by the way, you say you don't drive anywhere, meaning you don't have to like, you know, you don't take a, a one hour commute every morning and every Exactly, evening. exactly. So um, <clears throat> this town, um, the cafe is two and a half miles from the farm and I'm about five miles on the other side of that cafe. So my circumference in life is just that stretch of road, unless I'm out in the woods. And then it goes a lot farther because I'm always venturing off in the woods. Yeah, I, I, by the way, I walked with my dogs this morning. I did that yesterday morning as well. I'll be hopping in my pond several times this weekend. Uh, I love my farm and I like being in the woods and I like uh, playing with my dogs. And I agree with you about uh, much of that. And when we're in Arizona, I go for a hike so, with my pups. And then um, I get done working. I sit and have a cigar and a, and a drink and talk to Lori and look at the mountains. And quality of life is, is absolutely what we're doing it for. I've told somebody before, multiple people, I said, you know, I could work 100 hour days, meaning there's between the farm and having your own business and a few other ventures that I got going on. 
you could work 100 hour days because there's still something that you could do that actually does give you a return on your time or your work. I mean, that's true. I mean, I could go out here on this farm and I could have cattle again. And do you make a bazillion dollars on your cattle? No, but you could make money doing that. I could have a bigger garden that I then sell pickles. I mean, it's just same thing you're talking about. At some point you say, I could, I could literally work every minute of the day every, and you could because you could actually be making money doing it. And that's a nice problem to have, but it's also, uh, then you got this thing and I'm sure you feel it also like, damn, should I have done more today? Yeah. Well, you know, and, and coming from farm culture, that was my life. Um, you could lay me out on a couch and I could cry about all the overwork, the overwork ethic, um, because I felt in farm culture, that's how you marked yourself as an honorable human being. So this was a big departure. But what happened for me is, um, and I talk about this in the book, I started wondering if there was a problem with overwork culture and started researching it. And I started recognizing that less stress leads to more profit. And a lot of entrepreneurs, we want to talk about how much skin in the game we have. We have. We want to talk about how many hours we put in and, and we really want those bragging rights. But the truth is less stress equals more profit. Less stress, particularly when you're doing physical work like a farm and a cafe, you see my stress levels go up, you'll see the burns start appearing on my hands, you'll see the cuts starting to appear, people start banging their heads, people start falling down because you're tired, because you're not thinking, you're not present yeah. on the job. But the other thing is when you check out, and we have learned this is where the real genius happens, is when you check out, because there's a default mode network in the brain that when you check out from the problems, that's when they actually get solved. How many times have you been in the middle of the woods someplace or having a drink with friends and laughing and telling a funny story when all of a sudden you go, blammo, I know the answer. I, I've just solved this really critical problem. That's because the creative thinking happens when you're not sitting there just grueling, you know, grinding out at a desk or really pushing hard, you got to check out, you got to switch the mode network so that you can have creative problem solving. And as an entrepreneur, it's all about creative problem solving, anticipating what you're going to need to do next, how to move, how to navigate. Therefore, you got to check out, you got to have, I like that idea of the cigar. Is it with whiskey? I don't drink whiskey, it's beer, but you know what? Oh, it's beer. Oh. You're, you're dead on accurate. You know, I have some of my best ideas when I'm hiking uh, in the mountains with my dogs because I didn't go out there to think through a problem. I went out there to hike with my dogs and and breathe hard and, and make my muscles work. And um, then all of a sudden, oh, geez, the creative. So you're dead on about that. Driving a tractor can be uh, a time to think through creative stuff. You know, all those kinds of things. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Tell me about how you avoid being overwhelmed because those of us that pilot our own ship, again, you know, you could you could work 100 hour days. You could. Uh, you got plenty of stuff you could be doing. Uh, profitable or at least productive things you could be doing. It's the biggest problem I have is that I'm either checked out or I'm in the midst and I just get overwhelmed. And my wife says, Damien, you're, you're starting to get frantic. You're just, you're, you're your ADD is kicking in, which is really hard because I'm all over the place with my attention deficit hyperactive disorder. Um, and then I feel overwhelmed. And okay. So you know who else suffers from a lot of ADD are chefs. And um, uh, I would say most chefs are made, ADD is made for chefs because if you think about it, uh, you get an order in and as we I mentioned to you, I'm the chef in the cafe. Um, not ADD myself, I, I would, I would predict, but I've met a lot of chefs who are, <laughs> and I know this is a famous problem. Um, so, but, but having that sensibilities uh, for me, it's the radar. There's always an awareness of everything that's going on. But if you think about how stuff comes in at a restaurant, you know, you get a party of two that comes in your, your ticket printer starts printing party of two, and then you get a party of 10 that comes in and you got to generate. 10 breakfast orders, each one wants their eggs cooked a different way, each one wants something special, and they all got to go out at the same time so that everybody can eat together. Okay, so a chef, and there's high pressure in the kitchen, you can you start swearing at each other, you start slamming things. And even though it's your business, and you want the business, you get really mad when the next business comes in sometimes. Yeah, so you're there's a, little, a, you're, 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 yeah it's a lot going on, you're busier than all get out, it's hot. It's, 
Uh, right. So think- there's a way to deal with this. And in, in the food world, it's called mise en place. It is the chef's way of organizing. And, um, and I do get very deep into this in the book, the system of mise en place, because mise en place is how I run my whole life. It's, I learned to do it in my kitchen to cope with the stress of the kitchen, but now it's everywhere around me. So mise en place is translated from French is everything in its place. And you start with, um, if I were going into the, the kitchen on a Saturday morning, I know I actually have written protocols out on my phone that anything that I do that is a regular routine, there is a written protocol. Even if it's step one, turn on the light, step two, turn on the proofer, step three, turn on the oven. And it is written out. And I, over the years, I adapt these processes as I learn more about them so that I have an order and a sequence so that if I start in the cafe at 4 a.m., that when we put the open flag out at 9 a.m., my whole breakfast station is set up and all tools are in a certain place so that you're grabbing those tools at all the right times. And so that when you're done, you're finished prepping an order, all the tools go back to the same place. I should be blindfolded and able to cook whatever you want. Not always the best, but I should be. And I always aim for that. So then you take this system of mise en place and you look at your life that way. Anytime you're looking at the stress of life. So um, I have my sheet of numbers that I showed you. I also have um, what I call my yellow pad, but it's actually the mise for the week. So if you can see that out there. And what you can't see real clearly though is the mise for the week is the same process. So a chef tunes in and focuses and is fully present on the job. And then a chef walks away from the job. And that's a discipline that you learn. And when you have a good mise, a good mise en place, you can do that. So I sit down Sunday afternoon. I look at the calendar. I look at the things that are coming in. I look at the different work things that have to happen. I mise it out for the week. Every day of the week has a mise prepped. The night before each morning, I look it out and I look at the order. What's the most sensible order? And then you trust it. You trust it so that you're not putting your emotional energy into uh, trying to think about what you're going to do next. We waste a lot of, uh, the brain can only hold seven pieces of information at any given time. So you don't want to fill it up with trying to think about what you're doing next. When you have it planned out and mapped, yes, things go wrong, but you get distracted. Guess what you've got right in front of you? You've got your me's. You might have it as a list on your phone. You might have it on my bright yellow piece of paper. But as soon as you get distracted, as soon as the phone rings, as soon as come, someone comes in with their chaos, you can push that aside and go, okay, what was next? And that's how you maintain your calm and you it's walk more than away just from it. It's a to-do list. It's, a, it's an order. It's an order of- Sequential of, uh, order, yes of projects or an order of, mm-hmm. of uh, tasks. Okay. You're right. You're always thinking about the order. And when you're thinking about the order, you're thinking about what do you have to have in place to do that order. A lot of chefs, when they're in culinary school, they go to bed at night and I, I do this too. Um, my clothes, because I have to get up at three in the morning on Saturdays, my clothes are lit face down on the chest beside my bed so that I can get up in the dark and they're already right side out and I can pull them on in the dark. Like you just, <laughs> you, you want things so lined up that you don't have to be thinking about those things and you don't waste time looking for tools. You don't waste time trying to figure out what are you going to wear? Like all that stupid stuff, get that out of there. And, um, it does help you to just keep a presence and me's, I mean, some people leave culinary school with mise en place tattooed on their arms because it comes, it becomes like a spiritual practice of maintaining presence paying attention to process, maintaining presence. You're going to blow up because you got to blow up in the kitchen because the pressure is high. You do, but then you maintain, you return to your pleasant presence and you walk away. My husband and I, oh my goodness, you should see us in the kitchen. Sometimes we're in the back kitchen kissing and dancing, but other times we're just screaming at one another like crazy back there. But then the next order comes in and we're back to being best friends and we're a team and we move on. You leave it. You don't carry that with you. What's next? The way That's how you do with not it. Not just the, for chefs. My wife and I uh, have the same thing. Sometimes we're dancing in this office, and sometimes we're uh, we're we're discussing loudly a disagreement. That, that <laughs> that's part of well, that's part of this thing about running piloting your own ship. Also, a couple more questions for you. 
Her name's Shannon Hayes, by the way. The book is Redefining Rich, and I think you should pick it up because she's got some awesome stuff. Also, you can go to, uh, and we're going to get to your website here in a little bit, but a couple of things I want you to share with us. What surprised you? What did, what, you know, you've been out here for 20 years doing this thing. What surprised you? Like, what, the, what did you like going, holy crap, they didn't tell me this? Oh, my God. I was so stupid about all of it. <laughs> um, I think the thing that surprised me the most was that I like being surprised. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize how completely comfortable I am stepping into what is unknown. I didn't know that about myself. So risk, risk and um, unknown. That's the stuff that keeps most people going to their cubicle job that they hate. Right. It doesn't bother you at all. I would say that um, I like new things. Um, I, I'm not quite as risk um, tolerant maybe as I once was, because finally you get to a certain point, you're like, you know, I'm in my 50s now and I've made a nickel. I don't know if I would, I wouldn't put it all out there on the line for the next Right. Day. Well, what I was gonna say about that is, it's not about risk for me. I'm very calculated. As I talked about those four income streams, I've got those laid out very, very carefully. Okay, so it's not um, about It's not about risk. risk. About the There's a difference. Challenge. It's about going into whatever's next without knowing anything. And I discover that when, you know, let's take the pandemic. Okay, I'm running a cafe and all of a sudden one Saturday night, it's like crickets in there. It was hopping and then it was crickets. And then everyone who's in there is like freaking out about this new disease. Yeah. And then 24 hours later, you find out you're shut down for business and you don't know if you're gonna be able to open again. Uh -huh. So um, for some people that's cause for a lot of alarm. Uh, we pivoted, we turned into a co-op grocery store where we locked the doors of the cafe, we packed orders inside, put them out in a self-serve shed. Next thing we did is we built an online store. And the next thing we did is we said, okay, well, why don't we build an honor system store so people can get their groceries. As we learned more, we joked that we had to completely rebuild the business model every two weeks for the year of 2020. Yep. A friend of mine calls it the year of murder hornet bingo. And that, as far as, was that a risk? No, that was adapting. Right. But it was saying, OK, what's next? How do I adapt? What's next? How do I adapt? And what I discovered in all this was that's where an entrepreneur is strong. I thought I liked things predictable. And it turns out that was really exciting. I mean, I don't wish plagues on anybody. But what I did learn is that an entrepreneur is very comfortable with saying, OK, that's not working. What do I have to learn new to make this go the other way? And an entrepreneur, I don't think entrepreneurs are risk takers in the way that people who jump out of airplanes are risk takers. Sure. I think an entrepreneur, if they're really savvy, has their ducks in a row financially. Like I said, they've got diversified income streams and they're making a plan. They're not just throwing it all out because that and, and that's like not always the best the idea. Part of it, um, that, uh, you know, when I started doing stuff, I didn't do it with borrow. I didn't go, no, nobody gave me $10 million to leverage. You know, I, I was doing it with uh, the meager amount of cash on hand. So was I at risk? Well, yeah, but for what, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, you don't have much. The other thing, um, you, your thing about this uh, last year and what challenges it was, what one thing you learned that the average person now, even they're starting a business now, um, for instance, I, I rely deeply on my contacts and I can tell you that I've been doing a several different ventures since, since March of 2020, when the proverbial, you know, what hit the fan and it's because the power of having been out there for a long time and knowing people and having a track record, you know, they always say word of mouth. I'm like, that's a bunch of crap. It's word of a hard earned reputation, a well-deserved reputation, you know? So I, I um, relied on, uh, that reputation and also knowing people to get some other different things going. That's what I learned was the power of having a track record. Um, and also, like you said, adaptability and versatility, uh, like, yep. Okay. Uh, now this, now what are we going to do here, here, here? What'd you learn? I learned to stay true to what I'm about. Um, I have a, a deep calling in my heart. It's about n 
nourish and restore family, community, and planet. Um, that's what I love. I love building community. I love building connections. And I was really rattled when the curtain came down and um, this cafe that was really a community space where people were building deep connections with each other was suddenly a number one source of disease transmission. <laughs> um, because I, I found it really hard to believe that what I thought was so healthy was so very dangerous. Yeah. And I felt that my mission had been called into question. Yeah. And then I realized, no, I had to stay more true to that mission than ever. And I needed to help people maintain that same sense of nourish family, community, and planet. I had to do it with the new playing rules. And so what I learned was you stick to that mission. Don't just stop doing the cafe. Find other ways to help people do what you do. So we just built, we readapted the business, and now the business is much more stable as a result of going through that. We're still tied to that same mission, but we are much, much more stable. You're not going to go so far as to say you're glad you got shut down and uh, and and that people are terrified to come and eat ha ham and eggs at your place, are you? <laughs> I will say that I had my first winter off in a very long time. <laughs> and I caught up on some of those Netflix my husband was so keen to hit on. You. Closing thoughts, last tip, anything you want to tell uh, the entrepreneur, the business person, that uh, last thought. Well, the last thought is start with your quality of life. Start with the life you want to build and go from there. Look at your four income streams, balance them out, but keep them true to your quality of life. Otherwise, you're just running the rat race, no matter whether it's your own rat race or someone else's, you're still running a rat race. I love it. And it's not too far off of what I talk about in my book, Do Business Better, about this, the life and business of your choosing. That's what the ultimate goal is. There's going to be days that you're doing stuff that you, it, 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 like I said, it ain't every day in love and it's just rainbows and unicorns and it's not work. But you know what? More and more you want it to be the life of your choosing, which is what she's doing. She's going to get done and she's going to go out for a little walk in the woods or take a nap or uh, have a drink or something. So you know what? Her name's Shannon Hayes, Redefining Rich, Achieving True Wealth with Small Business, Side Hustles, and Smart Living. Her company is called Sap Bush Hollow Farm LLC. If they want to keep up with you because they like your stuff, they want to buy your book, they want to buy your, 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 uh, your products, how do they do it? Well, they can find me on the web at sapbush.com. They can follow me on Instagram at Sapbush Shannon. They can find Shannon Hayes on Facebook. Um, and they can follow. I have a podcast, too, where I tell stories about my life with my kids. It's the hearth of Sapbush Hollow. You can always tune in there to find out what's going on. He says it very quickly. It must be part of her northern New York accent. Sap, like the stuff that comes out of a tree. Bush, exactly. Like the thing that grows along the edge of the woods. Hollow like a low spot. Sap bush hollow not sapish yeah. hollow sapish hollow. <laughs> i do speak like someone who has been exposed frequently to new york city talk we do speak very quickly her name's shan hayes check her out go to her website listen to her podcast buy her stuff because she's awesome and i'm glad she's here until next time thanks shannon thank you damien i had a great time it's the new business better podcast <laughs> <laughs>